I've been tasked by Clint Finney to try to motivate you. And I'm uh, that echo, that echo here, just up here, it sounded like that. All right. I thought we'd start out the year by when you laugh. Did you have to agree with you to motivate it? All right. <laughs> You know, we've got some new faces in the crowd, we've got a lot of old faces in the crowd, but we want to we want to focus uh, our attention right at the moment on the mission of the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. I want to not I want to make sure that we don't deviate from the mission that we set out as part of the Grazing Council. The Grazing Council strives to promote conservation of our soil and water by growing and grazing and uh, forages and serves as advocates for sustainable, environmentally sound grazing practices. That is our focus. What I want to talk about today, you know, we how many of you have been with us for a good while? Almost all of you. And how many of you go to a lot of workshops? I try to go to a lot of workshops. I try to go, any workshop I go, I try to come away with at least one. Tim will talk to us when we go to the, to the uh, Law Forge and Grassland Council. Remember you said, I always try to come away with one or two things that I want to change in my operation. And I think that that is true for all of us. If you're going to take the time to go to a workshop or go to, you know, come to come to a, a meeting like this or go on a pasture walk, I don't think any of us, and, and there's no shame in saying this, there isn't any of us that do this perfectly. Any of us. There, there is always something in our operation that we can improve upon. And so with our mission in mind of grazing forages, growing and grazing forages, that is going to be the theme of what we're going to talk about here directly. It's going to be a rehash because I think the beginning of the year and this time of the year is always a good time to kind of go back over what it is that we're doing as far as grazers, going back over some of the, the math and the paper that we use to you know, help us make projected calculations of what we're trying to accomplish. And, and we're going to go over this. Now, click through this. What we're going to do is, and what I'd like to accomplish, I'd like for this to be somewhat interactive, or at least you're going to participate on paper. And then when we get to the end of this, I'm going to have a little bit of a discussion. I don't want, to, I don't want that paper just going home and getting thrown in the, in the trash can. I'm going to challenge you here today uh, the way I challenge myself to figure out where the holes are, where the inefficiencies are in your operation, and how I can improve upon it. If you never set a goal, you're never going to achieve anything other than just get yourself in the right, you're going to be in the right, you're going to do the same thing year after year, and your operation isn't going to improve, and we might as well shut down the grazing council because we're not accomplishing anything. Would you agree? I mean, I, I enjoy coming to these, I enjoy the free food, I enjoy talking to Terry, and seeing Hans and the boys, and, uh, but in the end, in the end, there's a purpose behind that, and we're all here to learn, and we're all here to, to fulfill that purpose. So, we're going to talk about setting the goals for the grazing year. And Clint sent me this today. The key to success is not to focus on, or is to focus on the goals, not the obstacles. Because, well, for the last two weeks, I've been working in my wood shop. I'll give you an example. I've been working in my wood shop. It's the same wood shop I've had for 30 years. And it was cluttered, and it was full of all kinds of stuff. And I walk in there, and I look at that, and all that clutter was what? It's an obstacle. It's, a, it's an obstacle to getting anything done. You know what I mean? So you walk in here, you open the door, oh, you got all that clutter, and you shut the door, and you never accomplish what it is. Did anybody else do that, or is it just me? Okay? <clears throat> so... We want to focus on the goals and not the obstacles. If you set your mind to the goal, I've been up, and probably I got a little bag in my mind because I've been up until like 1 o'clock in the morning, get rid of them obstacles. Okay? Get rid of those obstacles. Now is a great time to get through and get around those obstacles. Get them out of your mind and start focusing on the goals. Now, I'm going to stop here for just a minute because I'm very serious about this. There's no way in the world you're going to accomplish a goal if you have no vision for your operation. The only way you're ever going to move anything forward is if you have vision. It takes vision to get something done. 
Otherwise, where are you going? You know, vision is something that's out there in front of you. Not what's behind you, it's what's out there in front of you. So take a minute. I'm just going to shut up here for a short while. And I want you, and we're not going to go through some great mission and vision statement forming thing that takes hours. But I'd like for you to just take a minute and write down what, what it is your vision for your operation. Got your vision. Would anybody like to share their vision? Kendall? Yes, sir. Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to change the my goal to our goal. Okay. okay. And the reason for that is that certainly there needs to be someone in your operation to make decisions and, and uh, make that final decision for what you're going, but uh, I, I think from my personal standpoint, from what I've learned, the short time that I've been managing our farm is that it's better to seek advice, and that advice sometimes is best comes from your family. It's buying from them, and ownership from that. So, with our goals, our goals, this year is not much different than what we've been doing for the last few years. Certainly our goal has changed from when we first started out. <clears throat> when I started out on the farm, <clears throat> it was my parents and myself. My parents have passed away now, but through that transition, my wife come on board and now my brother. So it's still a family up there. So our goals have changed a little bit because I've learned through the years that, well, uh, that was maybe a good thing to start off with, but maybe reality or financial or different obstacles are there. Or maybe I've learned that maybe that wasn't the right thing for our operation. Okay. Through coming to meetings like this. So our goal is to continue to improve our farm and our farming operation, which is the basis of providing good quality replacement heifers that we can put back into the herd or sell to other people and, of course, provide a good quality freezer. So your vision is to produce good quality vision and freezer. Yeah. Vision. We'll separate out here a little bit vision and then goals. There you go. Vision and goals. Vision is kind of like the big picture. The big picture. The goals are going to be the nuts and the bolts that we're going to go through here in a little bit. Anybody else like to share their vision for your operation? Anybody bold enough to do that? Hold on. I'll step up. I did. I did. That's the name of the game. You don't want me to have to call on it. Which did. I did. Yeah. Vision. Uh, our vision is to have a productive and an income stream from farm. An income stream. Yes. Okay. Big picture. Income from beef and bringing that prizes, which. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Would you like to share it? Or your your farm, your family, anybody from that table? Wait, it, it's a little unformed yet, but basically I wrote down healthy passion that supports livestock in a sustainable manner, which includes producing profit, being time efficient, and doing it by non-GMO and healthy food source. Okay. All right. Anybody else like to go? Now, Bruce, I call on this tonight. <laughs> well, probably our vision is to keep going the direction we are with the cow-calf, keep with Forage is coming, and one of our big things is try to lengthen the grazing season. Now. Lengthen the grazing season. Okay, so we've got some goals there too. Okay. Anybody else like to share? I don't know. They've got some new faces in there. We just got water, water crops and uh, water lines. Okay, so these are some of the goals. Yeah. Are you grazing currently? Well, just to graze something this year. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 
story, our entire livestock group or groups, herds, flocks, whatever, how much forage are we going to need? Am I standing in your way? Or how much forage do your livestock need for 2023? If you can't answer that question, and you don't need to know it off the top of your head immediately, but if you don't know how to calculate that, then that maybe that needs to be a goal for you. That's a simple goal, is to learn some of this livestock math. Okay? <clears throat> how much forage will your livestock require this year? Now, we also determined that we have the ability to change. We base this project off of orchard grass and Ladina clover. But how many other options are out there? Infinite. Infinite number of options. There is an infinite number of improve varieties of grasses and legumes. We've got cool season and warm season grasses. We'll go through some of that here in a minute. But we have the ability to change that forage type. Is that a goal? Now you may be satisfied with what you have. But if our goal is to maximize the collection of forage, uh, solar energy, and turning that, that really is what we're about, is maximizing the capture of solar energy on the land base that we manage and turning that into a green plant so that can be utilized by the livestock that we have on our operation. We could make that change. And we'll get into some of the grazing efficiencies later over here. And you'll see what we mean by grazing efficiency. It's how we get from 30% to 80%. Okay, that's a big deal. And we have full control over the amount of days that we graze a given pattern. Again, this is common knowledge. You can find this in any forage book. But we need to understand that the growth patterns on the forages that are available to us vary tremendously throughout the season. And we need to have, as part of our vision, how we utilize that knowledge to provide forage to our livestock through as many days of the year as we possibly can. Because every time we feed a bale of hay, we're losing money. Or not making as much as we possibly could. Now, for some of that of us, that could also mean getting rid of some cows. We hate to ever hear that. Oh, and our sacred cows, they were sacred. But maybe when we get through with this, maybe that's another option. If we can't change some of this, then maybe we need to look at other, not other, other factors. But. So, the next question is. Do you know what your forage base is? Can you do a basic identification of the species of, of forages that are out there? I'm certainly not advocating that we have monocultures everywhere of a given forage, uh, but there's a, the need to know some of the basics and be able to identify the forage base that's out there. And if you can, or if you see an opportunity to possibly change that or improve that through fertility, and there's other things, lime, fertilizer, and things of that nature that would be possibly a goal. Just throwing these out here, They're, the goals are going to be different for every operation. But do you do your forage base, and do you need to change or improve? Possibly a goal. We talked about soil types. We know that soil types vary farm to farm, county to county, field to field, from 10 foot to the next 100 foot away, you got a different soil type oftentimes. We can't do a lot with soil type. 
we have what we have. However, <coughs> understanding where those soft soil types lie on your operation, you can change the way you manage that. Not only based upon maybe a gravelly soil or a wet soil, seasonality of when you graze, but also understanding that the yield of each of these soil types can vary greatly. So if I'm going to focus my attention on any of these soils in this picture right here, I'm going to be focusing on the soil types on my farm that have the potential for the greatest forage yield. That's going to dictate where I'm going to spend my efforts and where I might spend some fertilizer. I don't want to fertilize everything for this yield when I only can expect that yield. We need to understand that we need to use that information so that we're not spending money that we don't need to spend. So understanding your soil is important. And understanding how we calculate each acre of soil, we're going to take that and we're going to extrapolate that out so that I know that that acre of that Westmoreland seed slope has the potential to produce 9,400 pounds of forage for the year. So have you researched, have you taken the time after all of this to research the soil types that are on your farm? You can come to the soil and water office, the NRCS office, you can go to the wind soil survey and find this information. But have you taken the time to research and understand the soils that are on your farm and know where they're at? Yeah. You're pretty good with soil samples. Um, if you pull a soil sample, you just go to the top few inches. Can you dictate what soil type is in that top few inches? Are you no, no, it's it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. However, I will say, you know, it's not obvious if you get down in there and you grow the soil. It's got six inches of topsoil, and it's nice topsoil. And you go, you know, over on that ridge, and you have about two inches of topsoil and then you're in the shale. Yeah. I mean, you dig a little, I will say, you know, we have, we have this uh, uh, catchphrase that we do in, in the soil health is dig a little, learn a lot. And if you've got a narrow spade shell, when you're out there like pulling soil samples, dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper and dig around your farm sometime. You'll be surprised what you see. And like we've said many times, if you go to the fence line where there hasn't been a lot of tillage and a lot of grazing and you dig in there and you come 20 feet into the field, why are they different? Man, it's what's happened past history of that soil type that you need to work to achieve the improvement of those, the improvement of those soils through our management. We can do that. We can improve soils through management and, and get back to the more natural uh, soil that was there. But we're going to use this evident, uh, eventually to build the total forage base or yield potential of our farm. This example, we just used six fields of the same soil type, but you get the general idea. We're gonna uh, begin to work out the acres of the field and begin to, to take a look at the overall soil types within each of those fields to develop the complete and total forage uh, availability on our farm. Okay, and that is extremely useful because if we if we determine how much our livestock need, then our next plan of attack is just to determine how much our farm can produce. So have you considered the full production potential for forage on your farm? If you haven't done that, maybe you know acquiring copy of the grade five, uh, maybe doing some research on production potential of other forages and annuals. I mean, you get into some of the sorghum sedan grass, we're just looking at perennial production on some of this, but if you get to looking at some of these, uh, you know, sorghum sedan, what was the other you had to use? Millet? Pearl millet. Pearl millet. I mean, there are some annuals that just produce a ridiculous amount of tonnage. Maybe those are some options, but you need to consider what is that full production potential. Now, not everybody wants to plant an annual and has the ability to get a no-till girl and wants to spray and all that. I realize that. But 
uh, we want to take a look at what can we produce and what goals could we set to help us get to that level of production that we desire. From there, we begin to look at really our entire level of management right here. I cannot overstress this enough that when I begin to work with a producer that's just continuously grazed forever, they're really not utilizing, you know, they're only getting about 30% of what they're going to produce out there. If we get down in here and we're doing, uh, you know, a daily move or a two day move, I mean, the level of efficiency and the level of amount of forage you can see that cow goes up dramatically. Everybody understand that part. The efficiency here is incredible. But it also, that's where we get probably, I don't want to call them obstacles. I would call them excuses. <laughs> what would you call them, Clint? I was going to say challenges, but I like challenges, excuses. I like excuses hurdles, better. Challenges, <laughs> hurdles, excuses, obstacles of why we can't move cows every day, or why we can't move cows, even I get excuses for why we can't move once a week. Once a week is way better than, you've already got 200%, move once a week, 200%. What are the obstacles, what are the challenges, and what type of infrastructure can you possibly put in there to get to that point? I've gone through this, and I want to make sure that this is clear. We determined that that cow, that 1,200 pound cow, required 8,547 pounds of pork. And I had determined that we've got, on one acre, 9,400 pounds of production off of that west corner with orchard grass and the diner, just as an example. So if we take that and we and we multiply that times 30% on a continuous graze, that one acre, or to raise that cow, is going to take 3.03 .03 acres per cow to feed that cow for a year. As we improve our efficiencies, the number of acres that it takes to feed that cow or your livestock the number of acres goes down. I get this question all the time. How many acres does it take to raise a cow? Well, it depends. It's our standard answer. It depends. But you can see that moving from a continuous to seven day gives us a 200% increase in forage production. What are you going to have to invest in your farmland to get to the point where you can rotate once a week? You know, what, what, how, about, how much money or how many changes or what type of infrastructure are you going to need? I would I venture to say that the infrastructure needed to do that in a lot of cases isn't that complicated. Mostly it's got to center around water. It's got to center, center around the, the ability of getting water to your paddock so that you can do that. And we spend a lot of time, this is why we spend a lot of time looking at different watering systems. So you see the many different options that are out there. But you can see just going from a, from a continuous to seven is going to give you a 200% increase. And going from a seven to a two day is going to give you another 25% increase. So you can easily get 275% increase in production by just changing your management and building your infrastructure. That's pretty good money spent. Like Joel Salatin said, probably the cost has gone up, so I'll just double it. You know, he used to say 200. Now we say $400 an acre. To double your production, that's like buying an acre of ground for four hundred dollars an acre. I mean, everybody should get that. That's not rocket science. So, what efficiencies or what infrastructure is preventing you from reaching your full production potential? Could be time. But it could be time. It could be maybe you don't want to do it. Maybe John, like John Cavanaugh here, he raised so cow. <laughs> but what? What efficiencies are preventing you from reaching that full production potential? 
And I would say there are probably a lot of holes and a lot of little things here, little bits and pieces, you know, the extension of a water line. Uh, I gotta go buy another water line. I gotta go get another clamp. I gotta get another tank. Uh, you know, a lot of different things here that you could consider. But I would say that's probably a big one for us to consider. Now, I'm going to buzz through this last little bit and we'll wrap this up because I don't want to go through everything about a grazing plan. But this is what we typically put together and these are the kind of things that should end up on that worksheet that you have in front of you. I want you to, to spend some time either now or, you know, this, this week or this weekend thinking about things. But the biggest thing, the greatest, what does this say? I can't read without my glasses. Can't read it now. Action. Well, uh, I can see the action, but the action is the most important ingredient in all of this. We can plan, we can plan, we can plan. Quick calls that paralysis by analysis. Okay, there's a lot of truth to that. You know, we we get we start planning and then we just we rethink it, we rethink it, we rethink it, and then we never do anything. But the one thing, and, and Kit Farrow had had this in one of his newsletters. It's called, and, and he always has this little word, cowboy logic, and I like it. I put it up there. It said, action always beats intention. Action will always beat intention every day of the week. You can intend to do things all day long, but action is what takes the cake. So again, we're, you know, our objectives that, that align itself with the mission of the grazing council, we want to meet the nutritional needs of the livestock, we want to optimize our forage quality, yield, and persistence, we want to maximize the yields, Minimal investment. Uh, that, that really is a key thing. I get a lot of people, obviously, that want to take advantage of federal programs, and I'm just, I just keep thinking to myself, you could do, you could do this so much cheaper if you would just like keep this simple and do this yourself. You don't need to involve the government that's going to build this woven wire fence out here. What you really need is a single strand of poly wire and just get it done. Minimal investment. You're going to make money if you. At minimal investment. And I always, whenever I see that, I always think of the first time that I was ever on Earl McCarn's farm. Has anybody ever been on Earl McCarn's farm? Yes. I've been on that farm, and I got there, and that fence, I mean, he had a post here, and there was a post way out there, and there's this single strand, and there's 300 cows behind that. And I'm like, you want to talk about somebody who moved cattle and managed cattle and managed forages with minimal investment, I can't think of a better example than Earl. He did invest in a lot of infrastructure. Water, he did. But fence, we get way hung up on fence. You've got to have enough fence out there that you can sleep at night. Okay? Uh, we want to improve our livestock performance. We want to make sure our livestock are fed, for sure. And we want to protect the long term health of our pasture, soil, and fertility. So as we're looking at this, uh, you know, we're taking a look at our plan, plan grazing system and our plan for it. Uh, we want to take a look at, it's just kind of re-going over things. We want to take a look at what is the existing uh, situation with our fence, water, livestock exclusion, and what practices do we need to plan to install, improve, enhance, uh, to get us to that next level. Is there any kind of weed control problems that we're having that, that need that are that are big enough of a problem that they're causing us some yield loss or some, some other issues? Uh, what does our nutrient management plan look like? Have we, do we have any soil tests? Do we have current soil tests to get kind of get us in a baseline uh, knowledge of where we're at and don't go crazy with with all the the fertilizer and everything? We talked about this you know a hundred times. Focus on your lime and focus on some of the base nutrients. And, and I will say, I'll put this in here, that if you've not been in any soil health training before you get all crazy about fertilizing and going crazy with that, get yourself to a soil health training and understand from a non-chemical perspective what we can do to enhance nutrient management without spending money on fertilizer. I just came away from listening to Gary Zimmer talk at a Middle High Growers Conference, and he, he wrote a book called The Biological Farm 
And I had the original copy of it. The man is 80, almost 80 years old. He's got more energy than three of me. And he's farming in Michigan, I think. I don't know. But he's raising 200 bushel corn with no fertilizer. He's just using cover crops. And he's just, he's got the biological end of things figured out. And he does a tremendous job. And his book is easy to read. So if you don't know anything about that soil health, they might pick that up. We're going to see him or listen to Ray Archuleta. But before you spend a lot of money on fertilizer, I do some homework on that. Uh, you know, where are our contingency plans? This is a great time to think about a contingency plan. Because mud is everywhere. Mud is everywhere. And I, I've talked about this at our farm. I took a look at the amount of damage I was doing during the winter months, and I determined that the, the price of a heavy use pad to prevent that damage was well worth the money spent in order to not do damage and reducing my yields on the, on the rest of our pastures. So I made a decision you could easily pencil that out and figure out how many acres were being damaged and the cost of a heavy use pad, and that's paid big dividends. But now's a good time to think about winter and wet weather contingency plans on how to deal with that in a way that is not reducing your yield through the remainder of the growing season, because we have a lot of growing season left to come. Talk about record keeping. If you're not keeping records, figure out a way to at least keep some basic records. I don't care how you do it, whether you continue to do it. That's always a challenge. It's a challenge even with the, the cell phone and the migration programs that I've talked about, but it still is something you want to try to at least set as a goal to keep better records. Uh, and again, we'll work through that. We pretty well covered all these things. Uh, take a look at what your goals are as a manager, what are your objectives. Get those written down. Write them down and keep them, put them on a the refrigerator. They're a good place to keep in front of you so that you stay focused on this through the remainder of the year. If you don't have a copy of your farm map, you know, go on Google Earth. Go to the NRCS office. We'd be glad to make you a, a map. But this is very helpful. I've got these things hanging everywhere so that I can always kind of look at these and, and know where my livestock are. I can take a look. And, and make some projections. Now's the time to sit down and figure out where you're going to start grazing. You know, go out and take a look at things. But get a good map in front of you that has those acres, because nobody can memorize the exact acre of every field. But get a map in front of you so you can kind of kind of keep that in front and center. Uh, take a look at your uh, at your plan practices that you're going to think about implementing. What are they going to be? Again, we're going back over these things again. But this is what's typically in our in our uh, grazing management plans. And we can get you a copy of these. If you want a copy of, of this basic plan template, you can do that and you can calculate this. In fact, I think it would be beneficial if, if you did take the time to, to just get a copy of this and you write it for yourself. It does you a whole lot more good than it does sit in my file for it. Uh, but you get, getting these numbers of your livestock down on paper. Uh, take a look at how you're going to utilize these forages. Take a look at what your water system looks like, what your fencing system looks like. You know, just sit down and consider that. Where, what does my water look like? What condition are the fences in? Where do I need more fence? Things of that nature. Are there any areas on the farm? We always talk about environmental considerations, but are, uh, I would venture to say, though, even if you have streams on the farm and you're doing a good job of grazing management, you're not going to cause a lot of impact here. But if you've got areas, especially now, and we all know where they're at, if you've got mud leaving the farm and nutrients leaving the farm and into the waters of the state, I'd be looking at that as an objective to set to try to eliminate that. That can get you, that can create more headaches for you than you can even imagine for great person's season. Uh, again, document and think about what your plant weed control is going to be. Here's one we don't often talk about. Maybe we ought to do at some point in time. What do we do with stuff crows? Uh, things do die. Let's tell you a quick story about something that died. It was sad. An old donkey died. An old donkey died. And the kids loved old donkey. An old donkey died. And so I had to bury donkey. I had bought a track of and that seems like I carry more livestock with that tractor than I do put in water line or anything else, but it's been good for that. But old Phelps died, my six-year-old grandson and I had to bury it all. 
I was digging the hole for them, and I told Roy, I said, we want to make sure we get this deep enough. He said, I think it's deep enough, Nips. So the kids call me Nips. You never say grandma, so they call me Nips. I think that's deep enough, Nips. I said, I don't think that's deep enough, Roy. We better dig a little deeper. I said, if I don't get it deep enough, I said, the feet are going to stick up out of the ground. I'll hit him with a crush hole. So I dug a little while longer. And he said, I, I think it's deep enough. So I took a look at the hole and I determined it was deep enough. I reached over. I put the old dog down in the hole and his feet were sticking a foot out of the hole. <laughs> and the kid's eyes got real big. And he looks back at me and says, now what are we going to do? <laughs> I ain't got to fix it with you when you think we're too serious. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> uh, again, we Take a look at our nutrient management program. Take a look at our winter, our drought, and our mud contingency. And oftentimes, everybody knows in this part of Ohio, winter and mud go you know, hand in hand. They do every year. Okay, what are we going to do about that? Uh, take a look at what we're going to do with our excess forage. We talk about clipping, we talk about bailing, we talk about tall grass grazing, we talk about stockpiling. Okay, these are all things that we've gone through many times before. What are we going to do? Okay, and again, you can't measure what you can manage what you don't measure. Think about what, what you're going to do to keep better records this year. All right, I'm going to end with that. Do we want to discuss? Or we want to move right to the the panel panel discussion. You can discuss if you want. Okay, so we can turn the lights back. Back to our theme of if you come to a workshop and you take away at least one thing that you're going to do to improve your operation. And we covered a lot of ground there in a short amount of time. So, did you pick up one thing? For me, it's water. For you, it's water. You got to have water. Okay. What kind of water? Wet water. <laughs> Pressurized water. Spring developed. Turn it out if you want to, I don't recommend it, but it's possible. So water, you're going to have that. Yeah, water is going to almost always be, it's always going to be water. How do we get it? Do not be afraid to lay water line on the ground and pump it. It will go. Unless you're 400 feet up, and even then you can make it go. You can get water places fairly easy if you want to. It's possible. And it's not that difficult. John, Gavin, what are you going to do? Sell the cows.
You'll you'll do it. You'll find out. What do you got in mind? You gotta improve the, uh, the type of grasses that we're growing. Okay. We cover the whole spectrum of the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do really good in the spring, summer, tapers off a good bit. Mm -hmm. we, we're working on trying to tell. Yeah, there's a good opportunity there to renovate and maybe use some summer annuals. Great opportunity. Stuart, what are you going to do? I'm going to build some fence around me so I can make my rotations easier. Where the perimeter fence is not there, it needs to put in. Yeah. So I can get power to wherever I need it to be instead of trying to stretch it out. Yep. Now, it's reduced amount of time about moving the fence or building semi perimeter temporary perimeter fences. <coughs> be a little quicker and take less time. Yeah. Do that and improve on this. Yeah. 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 We're all short on time. Okay. Kendall. Now we're going to add pressurize a lot or to a lot of fields. And okay. Look at improving some of our the past year for a lot of runoff. There you go. There. my water line so I'm no longer <laughs> hauling water. Uh, and, you know, we did 3,600 feet of water line last year. We got to get to 8,000 to be done with the big water line, but then there'll be small water lines to feed off to smaller paddocks. Yeah. And those won't be very deep. Right. You know, they'll just be plowed in shallow. Yeah. And these are some of the obstacles. We talked about two obstacles right here. You know, the efficiency of not hauling water and not moving fence hole. And you look at that as a, oh, I've got to dig the water line, or I've got to build a fence. But when you add up, what, an extra half hour every day, do the math on that. Do the math on how much 15 minutes or a half hour every day for 365 days out of the year, how much time that is. And you'll build that fence in a hurry. <laughs> what are you going to do? Well, I have too much water. Okay. <laughs> We're going to try to figure out how to manage that, aren't we, Clint? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bruce. I'd like to take your grades five and break it up into fours for the four seasons. Because that was showing when that orchard grass was in yeah. prime. And we can raise 9,400 pounds, but I can't yeah. tell a cow, eat now, or right. live the rest of the year. Well, right. And I'd like to see a program where we could go into the fall and see what we need to be growing in the fall and early spring. So and, and, and I would go back and reiterate when you show those graphs. You know, I mean I show the orchard graphs, but when you show those growth curves for all those different forages, that's what you're getting at. That's what I'm getting is at. to break that up and say what do I need to plant here to get me through there. Right. And that's what I want to encourage you to go in and look at that. That's a key component. Yeah. We can yeah. do that Bruce. I've done yeah. it. We can do it. Um, Quite what are you gonna do? Uh, I'm in a little different situation. I've got a rented farm that needs to be. I either need to get rid of cows or I need to rent some ground. So I rented some ground. I need to get it developed so that I can graze further through the winter. Yeah, and maybe that's an option for some of us that have more cows than we have ground. Maybe we need to look and see if there are other alternatives and how we can do that. The great beauty concept. Grazing. Uh, just getting started. So okay. we're looking at a Jersey cows. So. Jersey cows. Okay. Okay. How about you? Uh, I need to get, I guess, my soil tested and uh, water tested too. Okay. I don't have anything right now, but okay. I should do my homework. Do your homework. Do your homework and get it planned out. Yep. Excellent. Did I miss anything? Pete? Uh, we have pulled some <coughs> tests. I hope to make some amendments, you know, with the budget and uh, the way fertilizer prices are and things. And then Use our compost out of the pen pack barn a little bit better, and then I'd like to try to figure out how to move the old cows faster, leave more residue throughout the year. Lots, lots of good goals. I think I accomplished what I wanted, which was to get everybody to think. I want everybody to think about their operations, set some goals, and make it happen. 